um, breakout session summary about some of the goals and some of the priorities that, that might be considered in the sense of uh, genome sequencing in a clinical context. So, you know, in this session, I, I think what we're supposed to do is really to think about the, the mechanisms that might be employed by NHGRI and the different strategies for, for accomplishing some of those goals. I, I don't think that discussion of those goals is off the table, but I think that what we probably want to do is discuss mechanisms and, and structures if, if we can. Um, Lucia and I and Adam spent some time um, trying to, to think about framing this discussion, so we'll spend five minutes here just trying to, trying to frame things. Um, it's important to recognize that, that there are these, these disparate clinical genome sequencing efforts that are going on now. Um, they overlap in some ways. They, they hopefully complement each other in many ways. Um, but they are eMERGE, which of course is, is designed primarily um, to, to take advantage of the electronic medical record phenotyping that has, has been carried out in a clinical context um, and engage in discovery as well as um, um, clinical implementation. CSER is, is really a deeper kind of vertical dive into the use of genome sequencing, whole exome at most of the centers, whole genome at one center at least. Um, to, to really examine its clinical role, its applicability, its impact, um, very significantly also with LC as, as part of that. The Undiagnosed Disease Network, and I think I, think I got those that acronym wrong there, um, it should be UDN, is kind of self-explanatory. Um, INSIGHT is the effort to use sequencing in the newborn period to see how it might augment newborn screening. And, um, and then finally, IGNITE are the, the demonstration projects. And, and the questions that, that I think uh, that we feel like ought to be considered, ought to be very front and center, um, include some very familiar questions that we've talked about for the last day and a half. One is, what will the landscape look like if the NHGRI doesn't do this or doesn't do that? Um, also an affiliated question, where is coordinated action necessary, right? And this gets to this, this um, point down here, which, which is, you know, want to think about organizational structures, and those can vary, for example, on, on really at least two axes. One can be investor, investigator initiated, right, um, all the way to consortia, but the other has to do with what the scale needs to be to answer these questions in terms of the number of people sequenced, for example. Um, I, I, something that has also come up in many contexts and is, is definitely worth considering and something the NHGRI will have to grapple with is when should the market be relied upon and when shouldn't it? Um, there's, there's some sentiment, but this is controversial to some extent, that um, when it comes to certain aspects of technology development, perhaps the market can take care of that. I, I would, for example, argue that especially in the clinical realm where the dollar stakes are very high, that might be the case, but, but you know, I think that's, that obviously is open for debate. I personally feel there are other aspects where the market is particularly ill-suited to answering questions, and that has to do in some ways with just pure implementation. The market, if they can make a profit, will implement things. I mean, the PSA is a great example of that, even when perhaps from a rational, logical standpoint, it shouldn't be implemented. Um, partnership opportunities with other ICs we've, we've talked about, and that's really important to get at. LC integration is, is part and parcel in all of these efforts, and, and I, one of the, the geniuses really of genome, in my mind, is that it's made LC integration explicit, whereas in other dimensions and other ICs that hasn't been the case. Um, what type of evidence is needed, right? Do we really need randomized controlled trials to roll out everything? Um, can we do implementation with evidence development? Are there other intermediate um, um, endpoints that, that can be used? 
The duration of programs is important, right? You don't want a situation where you create a program and, and it lasts forever. Um, they have to be able to morph to meet new challenges. Where that's coming up in a very practical sense and one that is, is you know, kind of open for discussion is the, the fate of Caesar. The, it sounds like there will be some kind of extension for a short period, but, but the fate of or existence of a Caesar 2.0, I think, is a totally open question. Um, and then finally, the, the really difficult thing in all this is, you know, you sit here and you listen for a day and a half and you hear fantastic ideas that, that run the gamut um, and they all, you know, almost all sound great. Um, and unfortunately, the NHGRI is going to have to make decisions that involve prioritizing and, you know, opportunity costs are a really big deal. If you do one thing, you don't do another. Um, so, so with that, I will, I will kind of, um, you know, I'll end, and this isn't a group that is probably reticent to talk, so I don't think we'll have too many awkward silences. Um, but what are people's thoughts about both the goals and especially the organizational approaches um, to achieve those goals? Maybe I spoke too soon. Okay, Howard. Jim, the, you know, there's been a lot of question about you know, how far into the clinic uh, in year I should go in the, at all. And, and to me, the, the reason why in year I should be in there is, is because of the lack of direction that there is currently. And the, you know, the marketplace is not currently solving it. It's providing solutions in terms of sequencers. Uh, the, the, the groups that are providing uh, the, the services are, are marketing based on very little substance. Um, even the things that we use <laughs> literally at our center doesn't always have the, the greatest substance. And it's, it's the Wild West. And the, you know, as someone who was born in the West, uh, the Wild West was not a safe wild. place. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, it's very wild. Um, the Wild West was not a safe place. You know, it, was a, it was not a place you could have an, uh, a, uh, a well thought out lifestyle. Um, and and uh, so you know, what future do we want? And so I, I think some of these examples you know, need to be done. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and I, we, we just don't, the, we don't have to drive the whole field, but at least some of the, right. the, these need to be done. And I, I would chime in with something that, that Sharon Plan has mentioned on, on many occasions, and that is that um, there, once in a while you hear this idea that, well, you know, everybody's getting sequenced, everybody's going to be sequenced, so why does NHGRI have to have a leadership role in that? And I, I would compare it to um, many things that have been implemented in medicine without data, right, without rigorous evaluation, that then we much later found out probably wasn't a great idea. The time to try to develop evidence to understand whether things are worth implementing seems to me to be early in the game, and that's, in my mind, a, a critical role for an HGRI. Um, and that's one reason that, you know, I'm fond of the idea of, of outcomes research with all the caveats that, that Eric brought up um, earlier that we have to be careful we aren't, you know, that, that isn't our bailiwick um, and, and we have to partner with the right people, et cetera. So, oh, sure. I, I do think one thing we probably didn't talk enough about is the incredible potential for new types of sequencing or types of sequencing technology to drive clinical medicine. So if we think of non-invasive prenatal testing, right, which is now a huge industry and rapidly changing how prenatal diagnosis is done, that was based on some very important or difficult originally bioinformatic approaches to next-gen mm -hmm. data. Mm -hmm. And so I think we probably didn't talk enough at this meeting about are there other such really new or different approaches to sequencing or sequencing different clinically relevant tissues that could drive medicine that doesn't involve, you know, is at the early stage, mm -hmm. not at the clinical trial stage that maybe NHGRI doesn't want to get into. Mm -hmm. So Jim, sounds like. Just to follow on on that, what's a little bit scary to me is if we look at non-invasive prenatal diagnosis. In fact, we've gone backwards in what we could do. So when that was introduced by industry, it could find trisomy 21, but it missed all the copy number variants. And even 13 and 18 couldn't be found. So we went backwards in what the technology could actually do. 
and that's what scares me about industry jumping forward with some of these technologies, not doing the science. Right. So, so I guess what I'm hearing is you, you feel like there's a role for an HGRI in, in figuring out w how these things perform and how they can really inform clinical care. And, yeah. Uh, in it, I, we shouldn't think, uh, we should not forget also about the area of preconceptual screening. Uh, to, so, so we stop having to make the diagnosis of at-risk couples for lethal uh, newborn diseases by having them have a kid with a newborn disease. Right, and, and for example, the, the Caesar project at Kaiser, right, is, is doing exactly that. And I, you know, when I think about, when I think about the penetration of uh, various genomic technologies into the population, that's got to loom large, even though 50% of pregnancies in the U.S. are accidents, right? So immediately only half of pregnancies might be, might be uh, um, up for that. Um, so the other thing that I would throw out there that, that we don't talk about much, my guess is that when it comes to genome scale or at least, you know, hundreds of genes sequencing, um, the oncology world will dwarf the germline analysis world. That's, that's my guess in the, next, in the next 10 years. You know, maybe we'll be in a world where everybody's getting their genome, their germline genome sequence, but I suspect we will be in a situation where most tumors are sequenced, and, and we don't tend to talk about that, and I don't know what the role can, you can speak to that. Now, a absolutely. I mean, we've been, we've been chatting about that. I mean, the numbers of, of normal sequence, oh, TCGA alone is huge, but the numbers at the centers right now are, are extraordinarily large for, for uh, normal tumor comparisons. I was going to make the comment, though, in the context of, of, your, of this vision for an HGRI going forward. I'm on the advisory uh, group for CSCR, um, so I have a good you know, sort of insight into that. I was very impressed at the, at the meetings. Um, but it, it, at least speaking in this format and with NHGRI and thinking of, of, of going forward, one of the things that I remember fondly about the early uh, NHGRI uh, LC projects, uh, this is, you know, in the 90s, where that uh, you could be at the table of these consortia if you were not NHGRI specifically funded. And I'm specific, and I've thought of this because the CSCR is operating as a very small enclosed unit. And I may have a chance to say this in my advisory role at some point, but there are lots of others doing what's going on at CSCR. And I can tell you just among chats that I've had with folks here, many more exomes to communicate incidental findings have happened at some institutions in the Northeast, okay, than have happened in all of CSER to date. And, and these, or many of these are peer-reviewed and funded IRB-approved studies. So you may want to think, and this is what Eric was talking about, Eric Lander, uh, in terms of the synergizing with other institutes in the context of the other groups, think about the synergies uh, with NCI and other supported investigators doing the same sorts of things as you're developing these consortia so that the consortia are not limited to the PIs of these few NHGRI-funded yeah. projects. This will give you a much greater, you know, power to do this type of translation and not have to pay, pay the dime because much of this work, uh, for example, at our own institution, um, we are we we just have to do this. You know, we have this incidental issue. It's not it's not an option for us. And I think this is true of the other large cancer centers. So programmatically, if I, if I think with a relatively modest support, you could broaden the attendance and the involvement in CSCR 2.0, which is one part of the landscape, but I think a very important part as we go forward and think where we're going to be over the next five years. Yeah, I, I, I just, I feel like we really do need to do a better job of engaging the oncology community because I really do think, you know, if you think about a path towards clinical utility, um, tumor sequencing is, is, you can really envision a path there, I, I think in many ways much easier than you can in a lot of germline stuff. So I'll, I'll take that uh, baton as a member of the oncology community as well as the generous community. The, but but there, the two areas that we've seen, and I think this was discussed in the, in the session yesterday as well, that uh, are the biggest areas of need where potentially NHGRI could have uh, a big impact are first, the, the yes, uh, genomes and targeted panels, et cetera, are being sequenced, but 
there's no right now uh, cohesive interpretive framework for, or even hypothesis, uh, you know, a, a sort of candidate interpretive framework that we can hand to an oncologist and say, use this framework right. as a decision tool to think about how to enroll patients on clinical trials based on the genetic information. Right now, they get the data in sort of a uh, scalar report. I, mean, I kind of like the, the challenge yesterday. It, it basically is a PDF, and then it's more or less, uh, with some descriptions, but then it's more or less up to the oncologist to figure out what to do. But in fact, there, there could be an entire, and this is true for not just cancer, but for other diseases as well, uh, kind of a, uh, one can imagine a, a Bayesian framework based on disease characteristics, et cetera, that sort of pushes up or down how right. seriously you take genetic alterations uh, in the context of that particular patient, which is different than what we often do. We sort of just take it as a yes, no, without, with ignoring kind of the disease context. But actually, clinical medicine is really based on context. You have the context, you have it's your patient, Bayesian. then, yeah. you know, the test that you've done is either relevant or not relevant depending on the clinical yeah. context. So we, we need a formalism for how to think about that. And I think that's something that NHGRI could conceptualize, could, could, uh, could push. And, and am I right? You know, my impression is that, that a lot of the somatic sequencing efforts, like foundation medicine, for example, commercial, that, that they actually eschew analysis of the germline, right? They don't want to go there. Right. Uh, ap well, absolutely, and yeah. actually, it, it, and there, and for good reason, and because I think this is exactly uh, this is exactly the thing that comes up when you look at you know possible uh, you know or, or likely pathogenic variants or variants that you know are putatively damaging. I mean, it's one of these things where unless there's a family history, mm -hmm. as, as everybody in this room knows, uh, you, you don't even you want you, you want to avoid reporting something because you you could easily. Uh, open a Pandora's box, especially right. in the setting where you're taking care of a patient with advanced cancer, and now you're raising questions about the family. You don't even know the family history. Right. So you, you'd like to go in the other direction. You know the family history. It gives you kind of Bayesian priors about things. And then when you see stuff, now you're, um, you, you're, you're you, you, you think about yeah. it differently. The other area where that could, that's just emerging now, but, and, and it relates to Aviv's challenge talk last night, single cell sequencing. So when she described the cell atlas, that was sort of the normal cell atlas, but one can easily imagine a disease counterpart to that cell atlas. And there are a variety of diseases where the pathogenesis is still obscure, and it really can end up being, you know, cell state readouts mm -hmm. that give us a clue how to think about both the biology and potential therapeutic implications. And you could imagine, this is something where it's, this is a longer term view, but the technology has arrived to allow us to start thinking about those kinds of questions. So that's an area that could be very exciting, very catalytic from NHGRI as well, but right. it's a longer term view. Right. Heidi. So in a lot of these um, clinical implementations, a lot of the clinical arenas, whether it be the physicians or the laboratories, look to their professional organizations to, in the end, dictate how this happens. And I think one of the weaknesses I have seen a little bit in some of the NHGRI-funded efforts is really ensuring that there's a connection to the professional societies so that when the guidelines are developed and dispersed that then, to some extent, dictate how things get implemented, that there's really a strong experience from these feasibility and demonstration projects that is informing the development of those guidelines. And I, I think really engaging in a much stronger way, and it's not to say this hasn't happened at all, but, but I think in a deeper, you know, stronger way to, to help and have NHGRI actually participate in the development and the, and the initiation sometimes, because a lot of these professional guidelines get developed a bit in silos, where it's the pathologist mm -hmm. versus the geneticist versus the cardiologist, and a, an ability to bring these clinical communities together around genomics in a more cohesive way, I think, could be beneficial. Yeah, and, and I would just add that, that from the standpoint of individual programs, it probably is important for an HGRI to, to to push those programs a little bit for where guidelines, you know, where some consensus can be arrived at so that then the professional organizations have something to sink their teeth into, right? Um, so we've got, yeah, Robert. Yeah. So I think that for the CSER consortium, which is the one I'm most familiar with, the most exciting scientific results of that are not even been seen yet. I think each of the individual nine centers in a bottom-up fashion have a specific set of questions which are going to be truly exciting and I think hopefully rock, rock the country a little bit as, as these come out. 
And I, did, I disagree slightly with some of the formulations we've heard in that we can't hold back genomic sequencing. I think we, just as the way we've been surprised by the adaptation of uh, sequencing technologies, we're gonna be surprised by the diffusion of sequencing into medicine, and we're gonna rail against it, but it's gonna be there. So what is it that we can do from the bottom up? And I think that we can do novel ways to educate physicians, novel ways to, to, to create these sort of consortia-based registries, novel ways to um, automate variant classification, and, and things like that um, that might function better from, a, from individual sites and even our one type mm -hmm. genomic medicine initiatives. So although I think themes can be set, I think we ought to rebalance slightly in the direction of investigator-initiated genomic medicine um, initiatives. Yeah, so I, I wanted to make sure and get there. I, I would mention that, you know, I don't think, I don't think calling for evidence early on means holding back, right? So I, I agree with you that things will permeate the field and the market will drive things, but the earlier we can get a handle on evidence, the, the, the better Absolutely. we can stop an inappropriate train from, from gaining momentum. Um, I, again, I think of, you know, PSAs. I, so I, your last point, I think, is one that we should get some general feeling about. There's a, there's a constant, um, there's a constant tension um, about how much should be top-down directed at NHGRI, how much should be bottom-up investigator-initiated research. The, the, the history of, a, of the, the Genome Institute, of course, makes abundantly clear why there's a very heavy top-down emphasis, right? You start out with the Human Genome Project, it, it had to be. Um, and, and I think there's a constant kind of reanalysis and recalibration of where that should be. Do people have, so Robert has expressed one opinion, and I, I certainly have sympathy with the idea that some of these hard decisions that are, after all, to some extent impossible, because we can't tell the future, could be eased a little for the NHGRI by basically enlisting the community by, by slanting a little bit more towards investigator-initiated research. But what do people think about that as a general organizational principle? Should we, should we double down on the, the RFAs and top-down stuff, which have been very successful? Should we... Um, should, should things be recalibrated somewhat the other way? Alan? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to remark that when I think about this question, I, when I think about this question, I think what, what, so are there a variety of approaches that need to be explored? That's sort of one axis. And the other is, is this going to get us where we need to go, yeah. or is it going to be too diffuse? Yeah. So, so if you can think about that when you answer that question, it'll be really helpful, I think. Gail. So I think CSER actually has a very interesting model in that each site has a very different project that they are taking charge of, but yet there's this incredibly active group of work groups that are working on common problems. What, you know, what about sequence quality? What does the report look like? What are the LC issues? And I think that nice balance, if you have everyone working independently, you lose that ability to learn from each other. And that's been an incredibly valuable component of CSER and then develop a, a common set of understanding to present to the community. Mm -hmm. So I, I like that model of the projects can be very independent in their aims, but that the investigators are tied together and thinking together in ways that benefit each other and then the, the global community. Mm -hmm. I just follow up on that. Jim, can I just follow up on yeah. that quickly? I, I completely agree, and I would say moving forward, probably the one balance we might want to strike slightly differently I think we've all actually really appreciated that we could present the clinical challenge we wanted to address, and the nine projects are all very different. Mm. It would have been, now that we've done this and we've all been involved in these working groups, it would have been good to early have identified common elements and common data structures just to, just to maximize the sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's been incredibly powerful to allow people in the community to say this is an important clinical question where genome scale sequencing could have an impact and not to have a central RFA that says we've decided these are the, mm -hmm. right, because we all came up with different right. settings. Right. I was just going to echo the same thing. I think that's the right model <clears throat> is to uh, have a structure 
um, and, and some targeted questions, and then allow investigator-initiated solutions around it. But if you just do individual R01s, you have a scale problem and a cost problem that I think is going to make it quite difficult to be competitive. And, and that gets to the other dimension of scale that I didn't put up there, but kind of the other axis is how many people do you need to sequence to answer some of these questions, right? And, and we see even within these different projects some tremendously different scales. Um, I think in Caesar we're probably talking about, well, certainly it's going to be fewer than, certainly fewer than, what, 7,000 people. Um, among the nine centers, um, whereas others like the next iteration of Emerge, we're talking about, they're, they're saying 25,000 or so. So I, I, is that a question that you feel is answerable? Is that one that is addressable at this point? How, how many people denotes large-scale sequencing, right? Is Caesar a large-scale sequencing endeavor, right? David's shaking his head saying no. Um, or, or to scale depend on what you're trying to measure. Right? And I think the other dimension to this, which is what you know, we were talking about earlier, is how does NHGRI position itself to lead in analysis or at least inference from sequence genomes when it's maybe going to control 5 to 10 percent of the sequencing capacity, yeah. right? How does it create incentives for data sharing or analysis tools or whatever that can, you know, eke out from the other 90%, even if it's half of that or something like that. I mean, and I think that's so, part of the, you know, yeah. it, it's, there, there's this huge amount of sequencing that will presumably happen in the context of care over the next right. 10 years, and it would be a tremendous waste if we couldn't figure out how to make use of that in broader context. Yeah, so I, I think that's a perfect way of putting it, right? I, I think that we, the NHGRI will account for a small percentage, but we have to make sure that it's a strategic quality kind of um, um, sampling, if you will, right? So it makes it meaningful. David, did you? No, I was just, just processing this discussion. One of the things that strikes me that um, is going on, it was commented on earlier, and I'm wondering how it relates to the current activities. It may be, it is, and I don't know, is, it seems like the thing that's happening really on its own is this prenatal sequencing. And it seems, my understanding is it's, hap it's ramping up and, and because... It's my understanding. It's my understanding without actually NHGRI making it possible or without necessarily this community, maybe some people are. are it's an interesting test of mm -hmm. what happens when actually the market starts to succeed and it's no longer can we promote the use and can we pave the way, but actually it just starts rolling along because there's some value proposition. Yeah. What's our role in that? What are we doing to respond to that, if anything? Is anything needed? I'm just yeah. curious, because I, I, what if we found ourselves like three years from now and it is happening, you know, are we going to even have an evolving system that will make sure we're doing the things that yeah. matter as the use cases develop See, on the I, I would argue it took off on its own because there was this really clear, transparent need that people wanted it, right? Whereas I don't think there's a lot of sequencing where people don't have as they aren't as driven to get that information. But, but, but at the same time, right, you can imagine that people would like some degree of clarity as to, well, what is the value of this sort yeah. of cell-free DNA? How, how well does it compare the information that's out there, largely produced by the companies? So, of course, they've got And what you know, we're finding, of course, you know, so, is that it isn't quite as good as we thought yeah. it was, right? From so, but, but yeah. you know, that, I mean, that's, a, that's a very good example, right? You know, if... if you know, one could create incentives for Natera to share their data or something like that because mm -hmm. they would see value in, you know, opening it up for the community to develop tools so that it could improve and so on. Research, though, that's actually trying to... Uh, so, it's occurred to me for a while that the, that the thing that we can do is ensure quality. One way to ensure quality, because it's great it's getting picked up in the world and Often that means good things, and sometimes it means that the lowest common denominator wins out. What this community could do, and what I think you know, some of us were, were thinking about doing at our place and it'd be good to do together, might be to have some challenge problems. To actually put out 10 genomes where we know the right answer. Yeah. And we just say, anybody who's out hanging out a shingle right now interpreting genomes, go interpret these genomes. We'll let you know how you do. Mm -hmm. You may find that people are pretty embarrassed. 
Or you may find that folks, some folks won't sign up to do it, in which case they should be pretty embarrassed. So we can play a role of setting high standards. In yeah. fact, you know, we've, we've been talking about setting a challenge problem. If others wanted to join in and a couple of groups wanted to set some kind of an annual QC exercise mm -hmm. that would let groups know and thereby let patients know whether you should trust Fly by Night Genetics Inc. Uh, to do this. Probably not. With the well, yeah, probably not, but they probably have a no, better but, branding or, or, than or that. Google, or, or Google Genetics. Or Google right. Genetics, or you know, anybody I mean, Genetics. Yes. If we did that, we get to set a very high standard for the whole field. So I would like to propose that folks who want to discuss that, we could get a little group, whether NHGRI does or doesn't wish to be formally associated with that, because it might be viewed as a regulatory role or complicated or might induce companies to go complain to Congress, or on the other hand, it might be a really good thing for NHGRI. I think NHGRI should, should work out whether it wishes to be in the middle of it or not. But certainly, a handful of groups here running a well-defined challenge like that be very would ratchet up this field's quality a lot. Yeah. I mean, it, and you could imagine even sort of a component like, sort of like the Genome in a Bottle Consortium that NIST is sort of setting up for sequencing, but sort of an interpretation It's an interpretation yes. one. And, well, and of course, it's different guys, in context. Cancer is a very guys, different problem a, than a newborn, than, than a newborn with, a, with, a, with some disease in the family, mm -hmm. sir. You could also imagine, if we had a gold standard, eventually doing the same thing for variant adjudication, right? Um, yeah, eventually. So there's an organization, ready. excuse me, there's an organization doing this that... Oh. Okay. The critical assessment of genome interpretation, inter it's basically a, uh, they, they keep rec recused a genome and send it out and different groups will interpret it and Steve Brenner at Berkeley has run this for uh, at least two rounds and, and it's, it's ongoing, um, it's not been particularly funded. I know they've approached NIST about funding a couple times. Um, it's based on the CASP model where there's a sort of a, uh, uh, recused uh, set of, of uh, reference information about the genome and then uh, so it could be that by so expanding a little bit the set of groups behind such a thing it could gain traction so Steve Brenner yeah. Steve, Steve, Steve and, the, and, the, and the dream competition yeah. as well Steve's involved in that and they're coordinating with that effort there's a great somatic uh, mutation calling challenge going on right now uh, that was that was uh, supported by TCJ, ICGC, uh, and 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 deployed by the the Dream Challenge organization and the the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health is also and working with them as part of a benchmarking right. and ongoing competition. Yeah, whether Dream activity. is the right branding is an interesting question because it may be that you want payers thinking about this and and whatever, but it's the right place to start. And, you know, get a conversation going. And the X Prize people had talked to to some of the community about the adjudication issue, but that ultimately the lack of a gold standard hadn't gone right. I guess just one more comment and then we're out of time. I was just going to raise the point that I think sort of came up is that I think one place that uh, we really could have an impact is really in is um, assembling cancer genomes and thinking about the large scale structural variation in them. I mean, this is a very, very hard problem at a very fundamental genomic level to put these things together, and I think mm -hmm. that we could develop ways of doing that. Yeah. All right. So we've solved all of NHGRI's problems now. That was easy. Thanks.